Um, and so what, what I'm talking about today is what's called the, the retrosigmoid craniotomy. And we'll um, get into some of the very uh, preliminary stuff here before we get into the actual operation. So for patients who um, are ultimately going to require this, comp, this kind of operation, and we're, and we're kind of looking, you know, in a way it's a little bit artificial, we're kind of working our way backwards, but um, I wanted to start with some basic questions about history and physical, um, which is obviously fundamental and a big part of kind of your encounter with the patient and, and developing a sense of when these surgeries even need to be done. So uh, first thing are the pertinent history questions. So things that you're going to be interested in documenting in terms of your patient encounter. And so typically when we're talking about this craniotomy, which we'll get into very shortly, there are questions about symptoms that are specific and that basically can kind of lead you in the direction of localizing tumors in this region and other pathology as well. So the focus of the history should really be about the symptoms that I have listed here. Oftentimes you'll have patients who are presenting with imbalance, issues with gait, listing to one side or the other. You can have patients uh, presenting with double vision. Um, you could have patients presenting with facial pain or paresthesias, weakness in the face, hearing loss, other changes associated with hearing like tinnitus, slurred speech, dysphagia, and sometimes even weakness or numbness on one side of the body that can be fairly profound. Well, this is, I thought, kind of a good overview of the symptoms that are most commonly encountered when it comes to pathology in the region of interest. And these are symptoms that should be uh, uh, asked about um, by yourself in your encounter with these patients. And what I also have listed down here at the bottom is you wanna have a sense of how long the symptoms have been there, how, in, how severe they are, um, any variations, is it episodic, is it been continuous? In terms of the degradation, has it been steep and rapid? Has it been gradual? Uh, things that trigger those symptoms. Those are uh, basic things that you should almost ask for, for really any symptom. But really in the world of neurosurgery and neurology, you want to really get a sense of when things started. And so how long has it been going on for? Has it been rapid over days, weeks? Has it been slower over months, even years? Um, yeah, obviously location, pattern, intensity. These are all important things. You know, almost every, you should organize your mind when you ask about a symptom, you should have a, um, uh, a, a set of questions for each symptom. So imbalance, sure, but, you know, is there something that triggers the imbalance? How long have you noticed the imbalance, et cetera? Basically, you know, applying what the bottom sentence in this slide shows to all the above symptoms. Um, getting to the actual physical examination, here we obviously focus more on the neurologic examination itself. There's obviously a lot more that goes into a comprehensive physical than just the neurologic examination. But what our focus on here is basically encapsulated by these bullet points. Almost for any neurologic encounter, and it may seem a bit ridiculous in the outpatient setting in the office. So the level of arousal, however, and orientation is you know, a fundamental and is widely applicable for any neurologic condition and absolutely applicable in, in lesions in this location that we're gonna be focusing on today. So um, seeing kind of how wakeful a person is and asking them those questions, even kind of veering into, if you'd like to the mini mental statics exam or things like that, um, very relevant. Your cranial nerve exam, also fundamental really in any inpatient setting. Um, but, you know, arguably one of really the rare circumstances where um, your cranial nerve exam might yield some positives uh, in, the, uh, in the outpatient setting and also as an inpatient, obviously. But um, this is where you'll actually find some of those more interesting cranial nerve findings when you're dealing with pathology in the region that we're looking at today. Obviously, motor and sensory exam, very important to document. 
physiologic reflexes, so just your natural reflexes, biceps, triceps, brachioradialis kind of stuff, patellar, but also pathologic reflexes, a Babinski, an inverted radial reflex, which is a little bit more obscure and more kind of in the spine world, but all these pathologic reflexes uh, warrant uh, uh, inspection, uh, a, a Romberg sign, for example. And having a patient walk, which is something I feel that gets glossed over quite a bit. And I'm not really kind of a specialist in the examination. I don't think many neurosurgeons are. It's really a little bit, in a way, sadly, the domain of the neurologist, because we've just become so imaging dependent. We're not really deciphering um, what has led to the symptoms anymore. We're essentially being handed a patient with the MRI. In fact, we, we require it as neurosurgeons. We're not seeing patients without an MRI. And so the utility of the exam has obviously dwindled over the years, kind of sadly. But, you know, I think obtaining a gait exam is something we gloss over a little bit and is quite valuable, especially when you're looking at tumors in this region, getting a sense of how patients are able to ambulate. Because for me, gait is often tantamount to independence and maybe a little bit of a leap. But if a patient really can't stand and take a few steps, um, and it's something that's very easy to gauge, they are much more functionally limited than you may even appreciate just by taking stock of them sitting in, sitting in a chair in your exam room or lying in bed in the hospital. So admittedly, in the hospital setting, gait might be a little bit difficult to assess because you're having to get a patient up and out of the bed and they're attached to lines, et cetera, but a valuable, exam, a valuable part of the examination. Now, when you have done your H&P, um, really part and parcel of your initial patient encounter is this is the additional workup. And as I was just mentioning before, the, you know, the neurosurgical approach is completely predicated upon imaging. And so CT still plays a, a role as, as you will, you know, see and can, and, and have seen, um, the CT is uh, really the initial study that's done when a patient really hits the ER and still does have utility. I mean, even a contrasted CT will utilize if a patient cannot get an MRI. And CT, I've had a few patients in the past couple of months who have come to me with a, with a CT or a CT was the initial screening tool obtained by the treating physician for whatever that patient may have had. But MRI is really the gold standard, it remains as such. Um, and it is a frustration if you can't get an MRI, if a patient has some incompatible implant. There, sometimes you, uh, you want the patient to have that implant removed if possible in order to get an MRI. That's how critical the MRI is. So um, uh, not only for diagnosis, but for your surgical planning, for your navigation, which we'll talk about in the operating room. One little wrinkle here, when you're getting your MRI on these patients, you, you typically for tumors in this region, and we'll talk about the region in more specifics. I know it's kind of, you know, coming a little bit later in the talk, but the region of the posterior fossa, more specifically the cerebellopontine angle is what we're focusing on. You want to include what's called the IAC protocol, IAC standing for internal auditory canal. That um, protocol um, which is a, uh, a subset of an MRI, is a very fine cut set of sequences through that region of interest and includes another sequence that we won't get into detail here called a Fiesta sequence, which is a very fine cut T2 that is often done for evaluating pathology in and around the trigeminal nerve for what's called trigeminal neuralgia. Contrast, essential, because it will be taken up by tumors, both benign and malignant. There are obviously some tumors that do not take up contrast. And the fact that some tumors don't can be a defining characteristic of that tumor. So contrast, unless there's a very strong contraindication, which is really rare, is a part and parcel of doing an MRI. And it's really ordered as an MRI with and without contrast. And if you're wondering what that means, it's you, it's important for you and the radiologist to see what everything looks like before contrast is administered so that when the contrast is administered, you could say, okay, yes, there is actual contrast uptake. 
So you can actually see what the baseline is and see what it looks like when there's contrast in there. That's an important baseline. In the world of neurosurgery, and in particular in this region we're looking at, the labs and medical workup are very limited. You're really only getting into the world of labs in general in neurosurgery for pituitary tumors, which is not the subject of this talk. But for really, and there are exceptions, but I'm just saying in general, in the world of neurosurgery, the MRI is the absolute essential piece and other things like medical workup and labs with rare exception tend to be marginalized. Again, there are exceptions, infectious processes, inflammatory processes, and that's where you bring it an LP and start looking at peripheral blood, you know, for, for whatever it may be from a white count to uh, antibody levels to whatever it may be. But for the most part, not, they don't really play a particularly large role in uh, masses of this region. For um, acoustic neuromas in particular, an audiogram is just something I felt obligated to mention here. Um, and it doesn't have to just be for acoustic neuromas, which are commonly associated with hearing loss. There are other lesions that can involve the vestibular cochlear apparatus such that hearing is compromised and an audiogram has utility. The audiogram is more, more than anything really to establish a baseline. Um, does someone have functional hearing? Um, and that may guide you one way or the other in terms of your recommendation. And the audiogram is typically done by an audiologist, sometimes independently, oftentimes as part of an ENT practice. Um, so let's get into kind of what we have been flirting with to this point. You know, what are the targets of the retrosigmoid approach? So of note, retrosigmoid, the terminology refers to the fact that the approach or the craniotomy is situated retro, meaning behind the sigmoid sinus. And I have multiple images here that will, will show that in better detail. It can also be referred to as a, as a retro mastoid approach because in similar fashion, it is behind the mastoid bone. And it is really a workhorse operation for neurosurgeons entering into what's broadly categorized as the posterior fossa um, and more specifically the cerebellopontine angle which is the angle made between the cerebellum and its contact or connection, if you will, by the peduncles to the, to the pons. And this, for whatever reason, is an area where a lot of pathology arises and a lot of pathology that requires surgical removal. Though, of course, radiosurgery has rendered some of these approaches less prevalent, if you will, or less necessary, um, but there obviously is a major role for this approach for larger tumors. The tumor that you're probably most familiar with in this region is an acoustic neuroma, more technically referred to as a vestibular schwannoma because it's a schwannoma of uh, either the superior vestibular nerve or the inferior vestibular nerve, roughly equal, maybe a little bit more prominent off the inferior vestibular nerve, not really in uh, significantly important for surgical considerations. Beyond the acoustic neuroma, you have a rare, uh, a more rare type of schwannoma referred to as a trigeminal schwannoma, which as opposed to the acoustic neuroma arising off the vestibular uh, nerve, uh, part of cranial nerve eight, trigeminal nerve arises from cranial nerve five, the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, and grows into this region. This illustration to the right is, uh, is an acoustic neuroma, but could be mistaken for really many of the tumors that I've listed here. Meningioma coming off the petrous region, uh, clival region, sometimes both as a petroclival meningioma, sometimes even beyond those two regions, um, common tumor in that area, and something called an epidermoid cyst, also referred to as an epidermoid tumor, which is a benign tumor that has characteristic MRI uh, features and is filled with keratin uh, for whatever reason has a predilection for growing in this area. Other posterior fossa tumors that can be targeted via this approach include masses involving the brainstem itself, rare entities, but there are times where neurosurgeons will utilize this corridor to get into the actual brainstem. 
And uh, typically masses in the brainstem that may be removed include a cavernous malformation, um, which is one of the actual relatively common spots for a cavernous malformation, albeit still globally rare. Uh, gliomas of the, of the brainstem, um, also these are rare entities. Ependymomas, where you'd actually have to go into the brainstem, also rare, they're usually um, involving the fourth ventricle. Um, thrombose aneurysms, um, shouldn't really say that that's much of a brainstem mass because it could involve the actual brainstem parenchyma, but that's also um, a potential entity exceedingly rare in that region. Some will uh, adopt this approach, even though the, the tenets of this approach really involve moving and what I like to describe as sneaking around the cerebellum in order to access the mass here. There are times where you could basically perform this craniotomy, just enter into the cerebellum and you don't have to actually go around. And you'll do that sometimes for a metastasis, a very, very common entity in the cerebellum, but sometimes you'll see forms of ependymoma medulloblastoma in the cerebellar, mat, in the cerebellar uh, tissue, uh, even though that's uncommon, even though those masses may be more commonly encountered, as I said, kind of uh, lining the roof or floor of the fourth ventricle. Um, but you very well may use this craniotomy to get into the cerebellum to access a tumor like that. And something we don't really talk about much in this talk, it's not really a focus on my practice as a tumor surgeon, though tumor surgeons do perform microvascular decompressions, it tends to be lumped into more of the pain surgery category and therefore more functional neurosurgeons tend to do that operation. Um, it, again, Broiler Bridge was a microvascular decompression um, which utilizes this approach, albeit a little bit of a more pared down, smaller craniotomy for that approach. Because again, you're not, you're not needing access to a large tumor. You just need a, a narrow corridor into the region of the trigeminal nerve in the case of trigeminal neuralgia to try to separate whatever vessel loop may be uh, contacting the nerve or a hemifacial spasm, which is another role for what's referred to as microvascular decompression, MVD. Here is an MRI appearance of a vestibular schwannoma, again, also known as acoustic neuroma. Um, things that you guys should know at, at, at your level sh uh, should be just a couple little tricks to looking at this. Um, the fact that there's enhancement kind of running into the canal here, very classic for an acoustic neuroma. Had that not existed, had there been a harsher line, for example, the likelihood of this being a meningioma is higher an acoustic neuroma, you almost always see this characteristic kind of widening, this kind of horn or V that develops as the tumor grows in this extra canalicular fashion, meaning outside of the canal. Um, this is very typical where it grows into, again, what's called the cerebellopontine angle, pons cerebellum, obviously the angle here, widened, distorted by the mass itself. Um, and you can see also on a coronal projection here, how there's some travel into the canal. And the majority of this, over 95% of this is extra canalicular in the cerebellopontine angle, and frankly, beyond. It's not just the angle here, that's what the coronal shows. It goes up so high that you get to what's called the tentorium, which is the membrane separating the cerebellum from the cerebrum and then down even almost so low that you're almost at the level of a frame and magnum. This has a very significant superior, inferior, or you can call it maybe even a rostral caudal extent. Also of note, um, I just mentioned this glancingly, the um, distortion of the brainstem, um, the distortion of the cerebellum, the uh, brightness of it, meaning the contrast getting into it, easily very characteristic of these masses. There are some areas of darkness, so it's not purely homogeneous, so it would be globally regarded as that, but there are there is heterogeneity within these lesions due to hemorrhage and cyst formation, and the cysts are likely the result of chronic hemorrhage. And so you may see some of these that actually don't have much enhancement because they're overwhelmingly cystic, which we encounter that kind of thing. So again, getting to the retrosigmoid approach, and I put down here also known as retromastoid, and some people may quibble over 
some technical differences, but, but really they're largely interchangeable terms. The basic concept of this approach is that the craniotomy, craniotomy again referring to bone opening, is situated behind the sigmoid sinus and ergo the term retro and sigmoid. The advantage of the approach is it allows access to the CP angle as we described, the lateral aspect of the brain stem and we just showed, we had a little glimpse of that. In the tumor I just showed you guys, a superior inferior extent of this approach in some hands can go all the way from the tentorium to the foramen. Though it is much more effective for tumors in the CP angle I wouldn't, some would argue that they wouldn't recommend it if your lesion was attached to the tentorium, for example, or if your lesion was exclusively in the frame and magnum. That's not really what the approach is for. It can manage to get to the extent of tumor if the tumor reaches those areas. But if those are the regions of interest alone, this would not be the preferred approach. So just an important distinction to keep in mind. And this is my terminology, again, not groundbreaking novel stuff, but I often refer to it as a process or a craniotomy that allows you to basically sneak in front of the cerebellum. And I think that this image, and we have many more images I have in this talk, shows you that basically with this retract, and this is a cerebellar tissue that's peeking out a little bit, and this is probably a little piece of telfa, and this is probably just another cover on the cerebellar tissue, you actually begin to retract the cerebellum and then your view develops of these structures in the cerebellopontine angle. And what I liked about this particular image that I got was that you could just see, you know, this is not just all tumor, which it often is when you're doing these surgeries because you're doing these surgeries for large tumors. Um, but this is a, you know, a much smaller tumor and you can see this tumor and it is a vestibular schwannoma at its early stage coming off the vestibular nerve. And you have a little bit of a sense here of the fifth cranial nerve I think the image is a little distorted. This is probably a little too close to this. And this being the, the complex, the 9, 10, 11 complex jugular frame is probably a little close to this. But the idea is that when you look around the cerebellum, you then have a corridor to this region. So that's the important concept for you guys to understand at this stage. So um, in terms of the OR setup, which as a student, I think is really important to focus on. Obviously the glory is in, you know, re resecting the tumor and, and, and teasing off the nerves, et cetera. But that's far down the road. And there is a process of building an education and understanding how to do these operations. And it begins with the fundamentals. You know, you can't run until you walk kind of stuff. And so understanding the OR setup, I think will equip you as a medical student to derive more uh, value from the operation, participate maybe even more effectively. It can be very hard to kind of find your way in the operating room as a medical student. It's a very tough balance. You know, we've all been there. You don't want to be you know, two in everyone's face, but at the same time, you don't want to seem disengaged. So you have to kind of strike that balance. Hopefully some of this information will help you know what's going on and, and, and equip you a little bit better. So preoperative considerations, even before you enter the operating room, and this has become really an emphasis in a lot of residencies. Attendings really expect you to know what you're getting into, sometimes to the point where you're discussing the case with them the day before. You know, some attendings like that, I usually am, am happy to talk about the morning of. I don't really require that. That's not a stipulation for me. But you really want to have a sense of why you're even using that approach in the first place. And of course, this talk is going to help continue to flesh that out. I will tell you that the approach to an acoustic neuroma, for example, which is really the tumor that's overwhelmingly accessed through this approach, can be accessed by two additional surgical approaches and the debates of, uh, regarding the merits of each approach, beginning with the retrosigmoid craniotomy and then comparing that to a middle fossa craniotomy, more often the trans labyrinthine craniotomy. These are huge debates in the field. Much, much ink has, has been spilled in defending each of these approaches. And a lot of it really ultimately boils down to, as so many things, to surgeon preference. Um, but 
what you want to do is when you are as a student going into one of these cases, it is nice to know why that approach was chosen. And it's going to be very hard for you to know that at a medical student stage. And that's a good question for the resident or even the attending, you know, why, why this approach, why are you using this approach? And frankly, a lot of times the answer is what I just said, it's comfort. And most of the time, the retrosigmoid is the preferred approach of the neurosurgeon. The other approaches are typically very ENT dependent and driven by ENTs and neurosurgeons remain extremely involved because at the end of the day, the resection of the tumor really falls on the neurosurgeon's shoulders. You also want to know, and though the goals of surgery are fairly regular, fairly routine, they don't deviate much. It's nice to know kind of what the goal of the operation is. Is the surgeon expecting to get it all? Is the surgeon expecting to um, uh, get uh, a near total and, and leave the remainder along the facial nerve? Um, is the surgeon going to be reaching into the internal auditory canal for that little portion that we showed you on the MRI? Is an ENT going to help? These are a little bit technical, but I think it's always important at your stage to kind of think of you know, what are we doing here? Yeah, you know, and uh, why are we taking out a small tumor? You may be wondering that. Or can we really get all that big tumor out? I think that those are important things to think about. And some of the risks of the operation, which we you know, have programmed into us as surgeons, but you know, at your stage, understanding kind of what some of the pitfalls are, are you know, it, it can be valuable. So uh, the retrosigmoid craniotomy, um, we'll talk a little bit here about um, all the the, all the following. So I thought, I think I pulled this from Coleman Godol's website, which by the way, I'm sure you're all very aware of Aaron's website in terms of all these details. In fact, I have a few other slides that, that have his, his stuff feature his, his illustrations is an incredible resource. It's for students, it's for residents, it's for attendings. I look at some of the videos on there myself. I have no hesitation in admitting that. I think it's fabulous to see how people do this stuff. And with videos, it's just a whole new world because we were not really seeing that stuff in residency when I trained and I trained within the past 15 years. So it's you know, 10 years really, graduated about uh, seven, eight years ago. So um, it's a tremendous tool that I think would have really helped um, accelerate our education um, had we had that. I think his effort is phenomenal. So this image I have here is how he likes to set it up and exactly the way I like to set it up. And that's what you should kind of be looking at the or kind of diagrammatically like this, where the patient is, the patient's head turned to anesthesia, even though the anesthesiologist in this image is over here on the bottom right. That's just kind of cut off. You, this is, you know, it's a more elaborate setup for the anesthesiologist. They're going to have their machine and basically have access to the entire side. The idea of having the patients facing anesthesia is an important one. Anesthesiologists like to have access to that airway. Can you face patients away from anesthesia? Yes, that's atypical. And if you're doing that, it's probably because your operating room is set up in a way that is not really neurosurgical. Um, what you'll also see here is the way the nurse is interacting with the surgeon, the microscope, the way that's set up. It doesn't really have the microscope. It just has these kind of floating eyepieces here. But the idea is that the microscope is here, that big physical footprint, and that you have the IPC here for the surgeon and you as the assistant, and potentially as a medical student, even getting in here and looking through these eyepieces. This is the lateral position. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, this is a monitor from the microscope that the nurse can see. You're obviously looking into the eyepieces. We now have more elaborate setups with things like, things like exoscopes that have put monitors at various positions in the operating room. But this again is a rough sketch. Um, here it looks like, I'm not sure if this may represent, I don't think if this, this actually represents a navigation tower, but that is a nice thing to figure out where that's going to be. Um, usually in a case like this, we'll have that at the foot because that has a fairly large footprint itself and you kind of want it out of the way. So it might be here, it might be here. So things to consider again in your mind. And sometimes even I remember certain med students I rotated with had kind of a checklist in their mind, kind of when going into an operating room, kind of what they were looking at. So the patient positioning, obviously where you're putting the incision, navigation, absolutely standard in these cases, though 
Uh, uh, some people don't, but it really has become standard. Um, important thing, not so much as a student to think about, but really as a, more as a resident, kind of the medications that are given by anesthesia. And it's always four medications. It's always antibiotics. It's almost always steroids in the form of Decatron. And then it's a question about whether or not you're giving anti-epileptic medications or mannitol. Anti-epileptic medications are not given in posterior fossa cases. The posterior fossa is not an epileptogenic area. It's the cerebellum, it's the cranial nerves, it's not the cerebrum. So those are off the table. Mannitol, the overwhelming majority of people are going to give mannitol in the posterior fossa. Even myself, who's really anti-mannitol and think it's overutilized, often find myself using it in the posterior fossa because it is a very um, tight space, if you will. And so providing some diuresis and allowing this allows the surgeon to manipulate the cerebellum, the tissue a little bit easier. Beyond the mannitol and the medications, neuromonitoring is something for you guys to just develop an early awareness of. Um, the specifics are things that you'll probably be tested on in your, in your boards and things like that. Um, and if you're able to translate that knowledge to the operating room, that's great. But we're typically, for these cases, monitoring bearers, the brainstem auditory evoke responses, as well as the individual cranial nerves. And specifically with acoustic neuromas, you're really interested in the seventh cranial nerve because that is the nerve that's typically adherent to the, to the schwannoma, what you try to preserve. We talked about the microscope and its position. And as a student, you want to be aware of some adjuncts to the operation. For you guys to really know what specialized instruments are being used, that's really advanced. It's not so critical, like a cartouche dissector. But things that you might even have a chance to get involved with, like putting in an EVD or putting in a lumbar drain. You know, some people utilize those for these operations. I rarely do. Someone's got to have very significant hydrocephalus for me to put in an external ventricular drain up front. Um, but there's some people who use lumbar drains routinely. In fact, I think Cohen de Godol, because he you know, really publicized his approaches via the neurosurgical atlas, I think he uses lumbar drain fairly routinely. Um, a couple of the things here I want to focus on so you guys can you know, further your understanding of this approach, the position. So the position for the retrosigmoid craniotomy is most often what we refer to as a lateral position, a true lateral position. Some will consider putting the patient supine and really turning them significantly in that supine position, which is almost like a mock lateral. And the way you can turn a, a person a lot is typically if they're younger, the neck is supple, and you really build them up with a shoulder bump that you're seeing here on the right. So you can see, obviously, this is not far off from this. This is your view here. I think, especially for a lot of these cases, which are fairly lengthy, you can easily get, you know, into the eight to 10 hour range and for some people longer. I feel just the latter is a little bit more physiologic for the patient. It may not seem that way, but if you're really turning the patient's head to that degree and really kind of forcing them up as opposed to situating them lateral. That's what I would say. I think the lateral is maybe a little bit more natural. The way you achieve the lateral position is, is you have to get the patient completely onto their side. You have them propped up. Usually they're wrapped in what's called a bean bag, which is when you apply suction to this, it stiffens up considerably. It's loose before you sit. So you're able to move the patient around on it. You're able to bend it and conform it to the patient. And then when you apply suction to it, it hardens, it stiffens. In addition to that, other considerations include what's called an axillary roll, which is basically a cushion that's placed a little underneath the axilla so that the axilla itself is not hitting the edge of the bed and you're not getting any kind of compression or injury to the brachial plexus. So, um, it's something that I think in some ways gets a little bit, it gets people really wound up getting that axillary roll in there. Um, you know, for short lateral operations, I don't think it's really that important, but for these lengthier operations, I think there's obviously a role. The bottom line is you just have to make sure that the axilla is free, that it's not wedged onto the edge of the OR table. 
for an eight hour period. Leg positioning, you can see here on the bottom left, the legs are bent. Some people like the bottom leg to be bent and the top leg to be straight. Really the goal here is just not having the legs straight and therefore the stretch on the sciatic is minimized. If you bend the legs, you shouldn't have any sciatic stretch. That's really what that's combating. Um, I often do exactly what's shown here in terms of taping um, is just supplementing uh, uh, the, uh, the beanbag here. Uh, leaving a patient a beanbag alone is usually not enough. That's just kind of the, the, the basis. Then you want to add some tape to that. We talked about head facing anesthesia. We talked about room for the microscope at the head of the bed. Um, we'll talk now about uh, head clamping. So I don't, I, just for those of you, obviously all, all looking at this virtually, this link is to Colin Godol's head clamp video. Beautiful little cadaveric one and a half minute aside on pinning patients. Just take a look at it. It's very nice for this. What I like about this image is, is it shows the three options that we just described. It shows supine, again, with, the, with a bump and the patient turned. It shows lateral. And you can see this is just a little bit more physiologic. This is quite a big turn of the head. And I think the exaggeration in this illustration is apropos. You have to turn this head pretty far. You could imagine for a 10 hour operation that might leave a patient with some neck pain. And if it's an older patient, who knows if you're causing any kind of issue with the cervical spine. So um, lateral position for the longer operations, the two pins behind the one pin in the front. I personally try to avoid putting that one pin square in the forehead, it's probably okay. It's a very small little gash that's made, especially if there's no repinning or sliding of the pin, it should be fine, but cosmetically, I just don't love it. And so I do try to put that pin a little bit behind the hairline if possible. Sometimes it's not, it's hard, it may skive because you're not getting the purchase. Um, I think Kogodol and others will actually show video where they have two pins in the forehead. I just, that's the minority, it's not wrong. There are many ways to go about these things in neurosurgery. Um, as you'll see, they're all very, many variations on a theme. I mean, right here is a perfect example for three different ways to position. So, um, but I don't typically do that. I typically put the two pins in the back here. And one other thing to note is the vector of uh, gravity here, if you will, is just one point is pointing down. And so I do like the idea of having one pin and another pin because I feel that's in the same vector as gravity. Whereas if you turn these pins and I'm having a hard time showing, you could put one pin here and one pin, here, basically rotate it, let's say 90 degrees. It's still fine but you're not getting the two pins providing the stability in plane or in line or in, ve in the vector of gravity. They're kind of, you know, you'll have one pin here, let's say, and another pin deeper, it's hard for me to show, but if you can understand what I'm saying, I do like exactly how these pins are aligned. Prone is pretty uncommon for um, a retro sigmoid. Um, it's just, you know, you can see you have the patient here, this is their back, and the patient is prone, but their head is turned. I usually don't want to put a patient prone if you don't have to. And, you know, obviously you can get this angle, this corridor here, which is your window, very easily through a supine or a lateral. So prone for a retro sig, very uncommon. In fact, the retro sig is often utilized by people who want to avoid putting a person in prone. So yes, yeah, so you can technically do it. It's not often done. Uh, a little bit of talk about the incision and the navigation. So linear versus curvy linear. I have been a real proponent of linear incisions in general. Uh, it's not like I'm in some incredibly novel category here. Um, I will tell you though, a lot of neurosurgeons, the tendency in general is to complicate and overcomplicate things. And I've seen a lot of wild incisions, a lot of long S's and U's and I just think linear makes more sense. I think it heals better. I think if you have to go back in, it's easier to deal with. That being said, and to bring back Aaron's video, I think Aaron makes a very interesting argument for this type of incision. And you have to watch his video where he'll basically show that by making this kind of curvy linear and spreading it in this direction, that it's easier to see over the tissue 
through your retrosigmoid craniotomy than if you do just a linear. I think it's an interesting suggestion, um, but the majority of people will use this kind of curve or a straight line. In terms of the incision planning, some basics. It's roughly two finger breaths behind the attachment of the pinna of the scalp. So not just behind the pinna itself. You wanna kind of pull the pinna up and put your two fingers there. And that gives you a very good sense of this. The rough uh, planning of it is based on being one third above the transverse sinus and two thirds below the transverse sinus. Of note, the zygomatic origin, which is traced out here in this diagram to the inian, which is that bony landmark that is prominent at the back of the skull over the occipital bone. That's roughly where the transverse sinus runs. A very useful landmark in general. So you you could just basically chart that out. You can even draw it on the patient's skin if you'd like, and then draw your incision above, below, at that um, uh, uh, width behind the, uh, the pinna. So I mentioned that in the enzygomatic root and the correlation to the transverse sinus, some of that's reflected here. Um, I, again, use a linear incision. This is Cohen's incision. This is another type of cur curvilinear incision. What I like about this illustration is um, it shows you where your craniotomy is. So, Hold, hold on one second for me here. Sorry. So the craniotomy is what you ba basically the point of the incision is, and incisions in general, you want to make an incision that allows you to make your craniotomy in a certain location. And your craniotomy needs to be in a location that allows you to get to your tumor, right? So that's that's your very basic thinking, but sometimes we get away from that. So this incision is just a little too long, a little too much. But the idea is that when you make this incision, you flap this down and there is the, the window you need to make your craniotomy. And then your craniotomy is here underneath the transverse and behind the sigmoid. So about the craniotomy itself. So we never use navigation for this operation where I trained at Columbia. I always use navigation every single case. It's not wrong. And the reason why is because the bony landmarks and the stuff I was just describing to you, and we'll talk about the bony landmarks here, are pretty reliable for this. So um, no matter whether the tumor is two and a half centimeters or three and a half centimeters, that retrosigmoid craniotomy is a standardized craniotomy. Maybe you're taking off a little bit more bone if the tumor is bigger, that kind of thing. But it's not like where you're dealing with a super tentorial mass that is kind of going to grow, you know, one meningioma may grow here, another one might grow here, another one. So the navigation for those is essential because there's no regularity to where exactly where they're growing. I'll make exceptions to that plane, you know, alley meningiomas. Um, that kind of thing, well, factory grooves, you know, you don't necessarily need navigation for that, but there are other reasons to do it. I like the navigation for multiple reasons, but my reason here more than anything, and I think most would agree, is to see where the transverse and the sigmoid are. So the asterion, that bony landmark, which is labeled here, and I guess is technically the union of the temporal, occipital, and parietal bones, um, is, is essentially where the transverse and sigmoid meet that junction and roughly a little bit behind and a little bit below that is where you place your burr hole. Some people might put their burr hole right on it. There are variations on that. Um, I like the navigation because I like to really see where the transverse and sigmoid are. I might even draw them out on the skin a little bit, make sure my incision's coming down in such a way that I'm accommodating that and that's that. So I use a navigation, I think the majority of people do, but it's not an absolute if you're wondering why some surgeons may not use it. Um, most people will do what, what I do on this, which is just one burr hole, really uh, essentially over the asterion, like I said, maybe a little bit behind, maybe a little bit below. I don't love um, skeletonizing or completely exposing the sigmoid of the transverse sinus. Some people are more cavalier about doing that. I mean, actually taking the bone off and, and and uh, the bone right above those, 
I just think there it increases the chances of injury and having to deal with bleeding and occluding that bleeding and maybe having to deal with sinus occlusion and that may, may be causing a, a problem after the operation. So you can see a couple of variations here. Here's the square craniotomy. Again, here's the transverse, the sigmoid below and behind. Um, this is the ear. This is the incision that uh, Cohen Godol prefers, which is more of this kind of curvy linear, allows you to spread the, the majority of the tissue this way so that you're not looking over this hump of tissue into your craniotomy site. One burrow over the asterion. This is the B1 craniotome of the foot plate. He draws out the craniotomy size he would do for trigeminal neuralgia, a little bit of a bigger one for hemispatial phasm, and, and a larger one for AN, which is acoustic neuroma, which is a, a bigger tumor and so requires a relatively uh, decent sized corridor. How large you make the craniotomy? There are variations on that as well. Uh, exact dimensions is probably in the two to three centimeter range, but um, you, know, you could increase or decrease accordingly you're essentially using as much as the incision gives you. You're basically coming right. I mean, of course, the sigmoid in front of you is a limitation and the transverse here. But in terms of how far down, back, and around you go, it, it, the, the incision essentially delimits that for you. This is not um, a right-sided approach here. This is a left. So that's why if you're wondering why it looks a little bit switched around, you would think the transverse would be here as it is here. You kind of see the blue, but... I like this view a lot. Um, it labels the transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus. You can't really see them well here. And frankly, there are times where you think you can see it through the dura and it's really not. And there are other times, you know, so it's, you don't necessarily see it through the dura. You might see some propolis discoloration. And then the question is, after you've adequately exposed this and then you can bring in your wand and confirm with it via navigation, what do you do in terms of your dural opening? Okay, so these are all things to think about as a student because um, you know, these, are, these will be regarded as the fundamentals and the actual act of taking out the tumor is a little bit of a different uh, ball game. We used to always open these in what would be called cruciate fashion or stellate fashion. Just basically uh, uh, incising here and cutting, 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 cutting and making um, uh, four triangular flaps. I find that very difficult to suture together at the end. And you do sometimes strive for a watertight closure here because you are into CSF cisterns and spaces. So um, I agree with the idea of cutting kind of just below the transverse and then just short of the sigmoid like this and then flapping it away. You could also flap it towards the sigmoid sinus. Again, thoracotomies, thoral openings, however you want to refer to it. You could do it multiple ways, okay? Some would argue that if you cut along the sinus, you're more likely to injure it. Some would argue that you safely cut along the sinus and reflect the dura as that one piece. You could uh, moisten it. It won't necessarily desiccate while under the scope for so many hours, and you could potentially then re reattach it a little bit easier. So there are arguments made one way or the other. Um, one of the critical, so once you have the dura open, it can be a little bit intimidating because essentially you're just staring at the cerebellum. So there's all this kind of, you know, positioning and navigation and, and you open up the dura and it's a bit of a letdown because you're just staring at the cerebellum. And you might even, even early in your career, even having done a few of these as a resident, get a little bit nervous because you're not necessarily sure if you're gonna to get to that tumor, the cerebellum just staring you in the face. And so you have to make some moves in order to get around that cerebellum. Because in no circumstance is the cerebellum not going to be staring at you in the face. The most common move is accessing the cisterna magna, which I have written here. And that is a classic traditional maneuver wherein you take a cotinoid, you essentially angle it down towards the cisterna magna, right by the foramen magnum. You walk it down the surface of the cerebellum. And then you see the arachnoidal covering of the cisterna magna and either with sharp bayonets or whatever instrument you choose that has a little bit of a point, you open it up and you start suctioning. You could get off a significant amount of CSF from the cisterna magna easily in the 10, 20 CC range and perhaps more. For that reason, I don't typically use lumbar drainage for this. Um, it's much more of a direct, easy way of releasing CSF. When you release the CSF from the cisterna magna,
the pliability of the cerebellum increases dramatically. And so once that's done, you almost sometimes can start even seeing around the cerebellum without a retractor blade. But typically you will need some level of retraction. I tried manual retraction, which I basically define as placing a piece of cotton, a cottonoid or telpha along the cerebellar surface. And then I just retract with my suction or instruments. I identify the tumor. I try to avoid leaving a blade behind. I just think that that can be a little punishing on the cerebellum over a long period of time. If you wanna put it down for an hour, reposition these kinds of things, I think it's more acceptable. Maybe I am in my own way pushing down unnoticeably more on the cerebellum because I'm manually doing it than others. I don't know. I have not had issues with cerebellar injury or retraction, but um, you know that's maybe a counter argument. This is, these are great images of suction on that cotton, retracting the cerebellum, there's your tumor, okay? That's the tumor surface. They've begun to cauterize it, stimulate it. I, typically you wanna stimulate the surface to make sure in an acoustic neuroma this is, that the facial nerve is not in an aberrant orientation where it's on the lateral aspect of this tumor, essentially unheard of. But obviously if it's there, you don't wanna go through it right out of the gate pretty demoralizing, but again, almost never happens. You then cauterize the surface of the tumor, open into it with sharp scissors and begin the process of debulking. This is another view with a blade where obviously you're not gonna see all of this anatomically. This is just a nice general view, but you're probably gonna be seeing at an early stage, hopefully you guys are seeing my arrow, I'm pretending that you are. We're basically probably seeing from here down to here. This is probably your window initially. And as you progressively debulk tumor, more CSF comes out, you will ultimately be able to see the fifth cranial nerve and up to the tentorium and some of the vasculature and even down here. But it's a progressive process and it's a process that's really abetted by the fact that a large tumor has grown there. That if you're just doing this naturally, the retrosigmoid corridor is not so easy let's just say in a trigeminal neuralgia case, to look all the way down to 9, 10, 11, or to look, um, well, I mean, obviously you're using it for the trigem, but you might not be able to see all the way up to the tent, for example. But again, you can adjust your craniotomies and you can adjust your angles accordingly. It's a very versatile approach. Um, just as one would say the terional is the workhorse for the supratentorial compartment, the retrosigmoid craniotomy will be regarded as a workhorse for the infratentorial compartment, also known as a posterior fossa. And again, more specifically for lesions involving the cerebellar pontine angle, this would really be regarded as, you know, the, the, the go-to, the real neurosurgery staple. Um, real quickly, just to wrap up, because we just have a couple minutes, the surgery. The, this is obviously a very broad overview. The principle of the surgery, and I really put in here for the acoustic neuroma, is the, the process of debulking this tumor, which is oftentimes much easier said than done, and the process of identifying the facial nerve. And after you get to a certain point of debulking the tumor, you should be able to uh, stimulate the facial nerve with your probe, with your nerve probe, usually what's called a cartouche dissector. And that indicates proximity. And then hopefully you can progressively debulk the tumor and get to a point where you can identify the nerve at both ends, meaning where it's coming out of the brainstem and where it's entering into the internal auditory canal. I think it's an exceedingly challenging thing to do. One of the hardest things to do in neurosurgery, very difficult to do well. I think the success rate, if anything, is probably a bit exaggerated. But of course, a lot of the tumors we're doing, we're doing now surgically are enormous because um, radio surgery has really obviated the need for open surgery, really for tumors three centimeters or less. And so we're only seeing the biggest and the baddest, and those are hard ones to keep the facial nerve intact. When you've finished your operation of tumor removal, and of course, just to reemphasize Cohen Godol's videos and their multiple videos that actually show the act of tumor removal. But I think for you guys, it was great to watch that. Some of the stuff we talked today, very important underpinnings of the surgery. We attempt to, uh, a watertight dural closure that I had mentioned before. Um, mastoid aerosols might be something that you hear the surgeon and the resident talking about. Um, those are um, 
uh, aerated cells within the mastoid bone that if not properly waxed can sometimes be an outlet for CSF and people can have CSF leakage and even CSF odorrhea. So very important to prevent that from happening. Um, ways in which the bone is secured. I was trained in doing craniectomy, which is a term for removal of the bone, complete drilling away. I told you guys here, and I should have talked about craniectomy at that point, craniotomy. I like craniotomy. I like having a piece of bone, even if it's fairly small. I like the tamponade effect it provides at the end of the surgery. I think it staves off a CSF leak a little bit more effectively. You could supplement your craniotomy with cement, other types of sealants. If you're doing a pure craniectomy, again, where you've drilled the bone away, um, then you really should put some kind of cranioplasty there would be the term. And cranioplasty doesn't have to be the hard plastic thing that you may have encountered in patients who get hemicraniectomies and then get an implant. It could be mesh-based. Um, it could be a cement. It could be methyl methacrylate or some combination of those things um, to secure the closure. And then um, the post, you know, I don't really get into that here because we were talking more about the preoperative stuff, but you know, there's always post-operative things to be cognizant of that I'm happy to talk about offline or in any other uh, kind of circumstance, but, you know, we're at the end of the window here and, you know, hopefully, um, you know, this was good for you guys in terms of just seeing the kind of pathology that we encounter in this region and um, the merits of this approach and some of the basics. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.